ago, he occupied this seat, this very seat that I am here today. Many years ago, he commentated on many of the sporting events you and I um, became so much uh, fun of. We, we loved it. it, it the, the description he gave to those moments that we saw was one of the reasons why we fell in love with sports. Many years ago, he was Ghana sports minister. Many years ago, he was a man uh, who many had described as the vibrant, because I recall the tenure he was the Minister of Youth and Sports. The, the Ghana Football Association <laughs> always said that they, they were under fire. They were under fire because the man who was occupying the seat had seen or been through the various moments of leadership of the Ghana Football Association. And in fact, covered moments that involved the Ghana Football Association. So he had a perfect picture into the happiness and the governance of football in this country. Here on Prime Tech today, we are speaking to the Venerable Neil Ante Van der Poel, a former broadcaster with the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. I don't know whether if it is appropriate to say a former sports journalist. <laughs> <laughs> are you I, a former? Oh, well, I think that I'm still a bro sports broadcaster and a sports journalist because Almost every day in my life, I try to make sure that the profession becomes better. So I call sports presenters and sports journalists like you and others and try and make sure they do the right thing, correct them when possible, and also share ideas with them. In fact, I, um, I was reading your tribute to uh, Joe Latte Senior, where you mentioned that he brought his son for you to, to, to groom him. In fact, you know, um, I met Joe Latte as a kid. I was then seven years, class two. Uh, my teacher then, Mrs. Latte, was the wife. Oh, okay. So he used to come and pick the, our teacher somewhere around four o'clock from school all the time. And as soon as he gets off his VW car, we start shouting, over to you, Joe Latte, over to you. Then <laughs> we follow him. Some of us will hold his shirt. Some of us will hold his hands oh, and all those things. And I saw him at that time as a mythical person, you know, somebody yeah. who could hold the whole nation spellbound with his voice yeah. and on radio. Those days we used to use the, uh, what we call the Kofi Adaka. You okay. know, the radio okay. transmission yes, boxes. Yes, yes. So we used to gather around the, uh, the radio set when there's football commentary. So it's about 20, 30 boys. Yeah. We gather and we listen to commentary. And when he's giving commentary, everybody becomes like spellbound. No, nobody wants any noise, any distraction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Joe Latte was giving commentary and you have to listen to him attentively. So it was with much pride, I was growing up, you know, so always close Joe. Range. And then one day, when I think I was around 11, and I went to the race course, and it was a derby day, okay. and the way he was mentioning the name of the horses, mm. those days, funny, funny, pleasant names of horses, and the way he was mentioning their names, and the finesse with which he was giving the commentary, I was just looking at him, admiring him from afar. Then something dawned on me that I want to be like this man. So he actually inspired your journalism journey? Yes, because um, my grandfather was so keen in my education and he was a medical doctor. Oh, okay. He owned um, a private medical facility and I was the first grandchild. Oh, okay. And he wanted me to, to take over. So oh. he was like tailoring me towards medicine. Yeah. But um, fundamentally, I saw within myself that I did not have the ability for that. I, 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 I care and sympathize with people so much that I may not be able to be a good doctor. So, Jolate inspired me. You can't stand me. pain? No, I can't. I can't, <laughs> I can't stand seeing people go through pain. Oh, wow. You understand? It's difficult. It's difficult for me. It's, it's sometimes I become too emotional. Yeah. But with commentary, you know, Painting a picture for people to understand was, I, 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 I was quite a good narrator when I was a child. So I used to do drama, I used to do a lot of performances oh, and things. Yeah. So it was good that I chose that side. But let me be frank with you. Um, when I got to know that 
the legendary Joe Latte was actually the husband of my teacher. Mm. It made me become more interested in him. And, 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 and as a child, twice I visited broadcasting. I visited him. Oh, Our okay. school, school children, we used to go to the zoo and then go to the broadcasting. Okay. Everyone went to broadcasting. I, became, I went to the studio to stand there, look at him, uh, doing uh, presenting sports at that time. And through him, I became fond of all the legend, legends of broadcasting. Ken Amwa, Nianum Thompson, Harry Thompson, uh, Eric Berkun, and all those people. So my transition from uh, uh, university to GBC was that smooth. It wasn't too difficult because I already, before I got into a university, I already had an idea of what you wanted I, to I be. wanted to be. And, and so it was easy for me to gravitate towards that area. So um, the first year I had a problem with the courses I chose. What were they? Um, <laughs> and I was doing the first um, year I was giving English, political science, and then uh, law. Okay. Uh, but then I couldn't pursue the law. And so I went back to the then Dean of Students, Professor Bully. I convinced him to change the law to classics. Okay. Uh, so the combination was difficult for me to hold. So it became English, classics, philosophy. All has some, something to do with English language. English, yes. You know, the pronunciation and all sort of writing and all this. So it, it, it fitted well into my dream job. And it, it was not by accident that I got uh, employed by GBC even before I left the university campus. Oh, so you, you were uh, in the university when GBC employed you? Yes. How, I was in how the did that happen? Or they had, they had seen what you were doing? Uh, well, let me say my, my thanks and gratitude go to the late president, John Eva Sata Mills. Oh, okay. When, when uh, Professor Kofi Kumado and Dr. Esuman used to run commentary for most sporting activities on campus. The former sports minister, Professor Kofi Kumado? Yes, Kofi Kumado. Oh, wow. He was I chairman see. of the GFA board yes, at yes, the time. Yes, yes, yes. The, league, uh, the, the law professor. Oh, I see. So they used to do commentary, but they were all lecturers. So sometimes they are lectures. And so the campus, the sporting activities are done without commentary. So one day I just said, look, after doing my 400 meters, I said, let me do the commentary. They were all surprised. And I did it with finesse. I did it with, with, without any distance. It is. You know, I then felt that I could do it, but I've never exploited it. Yeah. I could feel within me that I could do it. So everybody, the whole campus, the Legon uh, Athletics Oval, mm -hmm. everybody was shocked. Who is that? And then... Professor Mills just came to me and said, I'm a broadcaster. I'm a broadcaster. broadcaster. And I said, Inyo, it's okay. So the next day, he was in the Commission of Internal Revenue Service. Okay. But he was the president of the Amalgamated Sports Club of the University of Ghana. He's okay. the president of the Sports Association. Yeah. And I was then the Sports Secretary of Sabah Hall. Okay. So as soon as he said, the next day, he brought me this advert in the newspapers and said I should apply. So I just picked um, A4 sheet, mm. asked for his pen, and then wrote application <laughs> on his bo bonnet, car bonnet. Oh, I see. Just by the loggia, Sabah Hall loggia. Because that time we're training, we're playing football on the field. Yeah. yeah. We're training for the West African University Games. Okay. So I applied, and then he took it away and went and gave it to Mr. Kofi Tobi Kwachi, who was then the Minister for oh, okay. Information. Okay. So Tutubuka actually called me and we had a discussion at Nana Kwampim, the late Nana Kwampim's office at Opebia House, the top. Okay, okay. And there they were actually discussing issues about Accra House of Folk. And so they called me when I went there, I felt misplaced because they were discussing. So I sat there for some time and then he came out and told me that uh, the then Director General of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, Mr. George Ayi, mm -hmm. George Mensah Ayi, I had requested that I should come to GBC the following morning. So the following morning when I went to GBC, I was told that I should rather report at the old drama studio where the current National Theatre is situated. Mm. When I went there, a whole lot of people, over a thousand something people, and they were just looking to recruit just about 20 people. So we went to audition. 
I it got to my turn around five o'clock in the evening. So as soon as I finished, I went back. I was so so disturbed because I had missed my training. I didn't. I I, I was one person who never joked with his training. You were were you playing football or you were doing a multiplicity of disciplines, athletics, football, everything? I you better go back to the University of Ghana and ask them. <laughs> <laughs> I was a duck athlete when I was I at see. university. Yes, and also multiple sporting disciplines. I played football, at, did athletics, hockey, volleyball, and if there was rugby at the time, I would have played. You have played. <laughs> <laughs> but on athletics day, I was doing 100 meters, 200 meters, 400 meters, long jump, triple jump, high jump, 800 meters, 1,500 meters. Ah. Yeah, because you, at the university, it was difficult at that time to get people to do all the events. And so if you are good and you want your hall to win, you must sacrifice. My predecessor, who is a lawyer, Jean Morellet, mm. did the same. He was doing almost every event for the, for the hall. Because we need to force people to virtually do athletics mm. on yeah. the university campus at that time. Because the University of Ghana then was not friendly for sportsmen and women. Oh, okay. There were times when I had to do an event run to lectures, run when I'm in the lecture room, I will be called that the next event, I have to it's leave the lecture ready, room, so come, run, go back. So, in, in fact, one of the things that affected me as a student then was the fact that I had to spend a lot of time organizing my people to do sports, motivating people to do sports, and training on my own as a sportsman. It wasn't easy. Because Saba Hall, because it was a maze hall, you need to get organized both male and female, and female athletes. Some people had talent, but when they got to the university, they saw that, look, the sports will affect their academic work. They, dis they declined to do sports. Sometimes this way you have to talk to them, convince them to do sports. And it wasn't easy at that time, because unlike KNUST, at that time, UST, they, had, they, had, they end their lectures somewhere around 3 o'clock, 4. Then so the sportsmen and women can have time to train and do their sports. Mm -hmm. University of Ghana, lectures were throughout to the evening. So if you want to do sports and you have your lectures somewhere between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock, you either have to go to your training or go for lectures. You may have to sacrifice one. It wasn't easy. And our lectures were said that sometimes we have very early morning lectures. It means that you have to skip morning training. Morning training session. And I handled my training sessions with religious zeal. In the morning, in the morning, by 5.30, I'm off. I have to get all the other sportsmen and women in the hall to be up, get them onto the training field, do our morning training, close training, Make sure those who have to get massage and the rest are giving their massage. Make sure everybody had their normal breakfast and then before going for lectures. Hey, then the kind of things you did. But did you do this all the way up from your uh, uh, O and A level? Did you do? Well, to be frank with you, um, a O level, yes, I did some sports to the extent that I started. I started first, I started my sports life as a boxer. So, as a boxer? Yes. Well, no, I'm not taking it back. I'm going to wear your I started as a boxer. I was in the same gym with the Clothe Brothers, Tenda, Hector, Judas. Oh, okay. And then I had to leave Accra to Sunyani to join my father. So when I went to Sunyani, I was in the same gym, the Sunyani Coronation Gym with the late Kwame Jato, who was then a heavyweight boxer, and Nana Yakuledu. So it was basically about five of us in the gym, and I, the gym was so, so dilapidated. The facilities were poor. So those days, we do more of stamina work and just punching. Because you didn't have the sort of, uh, let me say, gym where you can do your leg movements yeah, and things yeah. as I was used to in Accra. So in fact, when I got to Sunyani, I was far, far better than those who were there. So we had to go through the training. You were more them. of the approved. 
Yes, <laughs> uh, more, more or less. And uh, to be frank with you, um, Nana Akunedu will still tell you up to today that I would really impacted on him because when we put on the gloves, the two of us, he was always in my hands. I used to give it to him very well. Fortunately for, for him, at the National Day Games, he won. He won the gold and was called to the national team. I wasn't called because I lost in the quarterfinals. I met a better boxer from Gra Gra. Okay. And, and in fact, I couldn't stand it. <laughs> well, that one it. ended your, your, boxing, your boxing dream? No, really. When I went back to Sunyani, in the secondary school, you know, I was going through difficulty because I was in secondary school in the boarding house at Bichim. Okay. Bichim. And I had to go to Sunyani for training. So it means that I always have to take an Asian uh, to go for training. Because we didn't have a boxing gym in Bichim. Yeah. So virtually what I was doing was to do the stamina work, the road work, and not do my shadow boxing all the time on campus. Then weekends, when I get the opportunity to go, before I can do real uh, uh, bag, yeah, yeah, bag yeah. punching bags and all those things. So it, 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 I could see that it was just fading off slowly. So I decided to divert more to the football. But initially, I was much more interested in boxing than football. Then infrastructure deficit was the core thing that impacted your boxing Yes, boxing seriously, I would say that. Because, um, and that is why when I became minister, I was keen in developing the boxing infrastructure in all the regions. Because, let me be frank with you, we have the potential to become much more better sports nation through boxing than in football. You see, the, the Ghanaian naturally have that latent knowledge in boxing, even from the north down to the south. Today, let me be frank with you, we are getting even much more better boxers from the northern part of the country than even, even the south. Wow. Yes. Um, I was so much into the boxing league, and I saw most of the boxers who were good oh, okay. had okay. all come from the north. I see. You know, the northerners had, are naturally strong, but it's the knowledge, the skill, the they technique that they need to adopt. So when you have somebody who is so much passionate, interested, and you transfer in knowledge, the technique to the person, and that he use, he gets that to complement his natural strength. He's super. I see. Super. Honorable, I will bring you, I will bring you back to the point of you going to join thousand others to audition to get to uh, GVC. But your early beginnings, how would you describe them? Tough. How was it like? Tough. Survival of the fittest. I I was born in Nima. Then I came to Zongolin. And those were the days when you are food. Somebody can just, you know, bully you and take your food away from you. You have a football, somebody can bully you, take it away from you. Every day of your life you go out there, there's somebody there who wants to bully you. So you need to be tough. People will knock you, you have to knock them. People will hit you, you have to hit them. So there was no day that I don't get pushed and I don't push others. Every day of my life as a boy, I was pushed and I pushed others. I was kicked and I kicked others. I was hit and I hit others. So it was a tough life and it toughened me. Um, I also, even though I come from a family that is quite prominent here in Accra. My father and mother were just public servants, you know, and so I didn't get it rosy, and I had to struggle. So playing Muncheni around, football around, to get some money to support yourself, um, doing odd jobs, you know, going to carry concrete at building uh, construction sites, Scavenging to the drains in Accra. I was I was a scavenger. 
it wasn't easy because it was quite tough for um, me to decide to further my education because just after some time, my father felt that, look, you better go and get it. I'm going I'm to give you a job at the, the city council to be a city guard. At the time, he changed his mind. I wanted to go to the police. I wanted to go to the army. No. So my mother saw that uh, I was doing good academically. So my mother was encouraging me. If I tell you that one day, my father virtually beat up my mother because my mother was resisting his decision to let me go to the army. My mother felt that with my academic performance, I should continue. She was ready. So my father didn't know how I went to secondary school. My mother an secretly, my mother had to secretly send money through people to buy me um, the books I needed. I had to study the books, the cover of darkness. When my father is coming, I have to hide the, the books under my bed. Because he was then seriously convinced that the way forward for me was to join the army. It wasn't easy. So, um, my mother decided that she would do everything to make sure I get education that I, I desire. I was, even though I was doing sports all over, playing football here and there, boxing here and there, I was also very, very keen with my books. I didn't joke. I used to, it, it, yeah. th things became difficult to a time, brother. I, I was selling kebab. Up to today, my family, some members of my family do sell. It is our trade. It's like our business. My family members do. When you are having a program, just tell me. I will let them come and do the kebab for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we do it. We do it so well. Yeah, I see. So well. Yeah, we do it so well. I know how to do it. I, I, I can do it for myself. I can do it for you for a fee. Just that me, when I'm going to do it, yeah, my, the charges will be much more higher. <laughs> because <laughs> of where you sit now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's business that really helped me because I'll be sitting behind my kebab table at the Metropole uh, nightclub in Accra and be reading my books. And that's how I survived through education because okay. it was difficult for my mother to be able to do it alone. Honorable, you mentioned something earlier about how your granddad had a private hospital, wanted you to get into his lane, mm. but you still had a very difficult life. How did that happen? Uh, you see, my granddad was married to a white lady, and so my father protested. In fact, he was fighting for the mother when my grandfather came from the UK with a white lady. So it became a problem. He had a problem with his father. So as in your grandfather was um, uh, married as a poly yeah. polygamous, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. How many wives? Two. Two wives? Yes. Okay. My father's mother, that my grandmother, and then a white lady. So my father had a problem with the father, and the father asked him not to come close to him anymore. And because of the way my father behaved, my step grandmother did not allow us into into their, their their home in Adraka. So we have to leave the house and go to my father's house. My father inherited that house from his grandmother. But then, because my grandfather was outside the country, we were living in my grandfather's house in Adraka. So I was attending All Saints, which was just a walking distance. All Saints Anglican Primary School was just 200 meters from my house. So when they had a problem and my grandfather said, look, leave my house, go to your house. My father just had to move with us back to his house in Zongolene. So that is what severed the sort of direct relationship a bit with my grandfather. But then in his will, he willed the hospital to me if I did medicine. 
if I didn't, give it out to social department of social welfare. Oh. Yeah. And because you didn't, it went to them? Yes. But I, I, I never regretted. And I've always been proud of myself that I did what I desired, what I wanted to do. And I was not forced to do what I didn't want to do. <coughs> oh, no. But my father didn't care. My mother was a bit disturbed because she thought that there was this inheritance for me. So she was pushing me, pushing me to do. So my mother was very, very, uh, let me say, disappointed when I didn't do medicine. But later on when I started working GBC and on television, yeah, You on were making radio, a name for yourself. Yeah, she became very happy. She became very happy and she, she got convinced that, well, uh, if that is a path God has chosen for me, she was okay with it. But, but considering the, the, the fact that the relationship between your grandfather and your father w went sour a bit, mm. would you say that kind of also affected the, the kind of life that you would have had? Assuming they had a very good relationship, your grandfather would have contributed to, to, to your education. My grandfather would have forced me to do the medicine. And I wouldn't be Neil until. You probably would have been Dr. Neil Lante Van der Poy in but that But then hospital. you wouldn't be sitting here interviewing me. Probably I would also be a health, <laughs> <laughs> a health reporter. You wouldn't be sitting here interviewing me. And maybe I wouldn't have gotten the opportunity to be um, a minister of sports in Ghana. You understand? God chooses our paths for us. All that you needed to do is to know the sort of destiny or the sort of path God has chosen for you and then tap into it. Now let's go back to the audition that you had with yeah. hundreds and thousands of yeah. others because you needed only 20 people. You know the funny thing? One of the panelists of that audition just passed. Oh. And I doffed my heart. He was great, a great person. Exactly. Godwin Avenable. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The 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 grandmaster. The grandmaster. And I, he, you know, I don't know. He fell in love with me as soon as I got into GBC, helped in my shaping, my training. He really did help. Sometimes he would just invite me. I'll pick scripts. Read the scripts before him. He would correct my pronunciation. He would tell me how to do my pauses and all. That. He was, he really helped me. He really helped me. So, so talk to us about that audition. After you say you had the opportunity to audition around five p.m. Yeah. Af, af, after that, what happened? After that, I just went back to Legon. I was in Legon. Then one day, we we're, were training because we we're then going to play the Gusa Games, Ghana University Sports Classical Games. Uh, we were hosting. Uh, at Legon, the football. You've always hosted this event. <laughs> <laughs> because I think the other schools were always happy had coming to Accra. I, I, I remember, was it 20 or 2019 that uh, they gave one to UPSA to host? I went there to cover it. Uh, <laughs> so we were training. As soon as we finished training, at that time, um, Coach Sapon, mm -hmm. Manuel Sapon was our coach. Oh, uh, Professor Mills, Shapiro. Yes, Professor Mills intentionally uh, brought him from Accra Academy oh, okay. to come and help us. Because then, before then, we are having the late Samamat FU okay. as our coach, together with uh, Mr. W.K. Agra. But Samamat FU got a contract and he had to leave Ghana. So when he left, um, Professor Bani took over. And then he was handling us a bit before Shapiro came. And when Shapiro came, his first training, he wanted to change my position. <laughs> um, Were you tiny? I wa I've always been who I am, just like you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, and, and I was fast. I was very fast. I was one of the quickest footballers at that time. Yeah, I see. Um, we had, if you're talking about speed at that time, maybe the only person who could beat me at that time was uh, Matisse Yama, who okay. was then playing for Great Olympics. He played in an assisting. I mean, the first and assistant Scotland. Yeah. Yeah, Matty Sama. But then he was um, playing for Great Olympics. He was a speedster. 
and Matizama was playing the wing. And because of my speed, Shapiro wanted to push me to the wing. As in a right back or a right left no, wing? I was playing a right, right winger. I was playing right fullback. Okay. But he wanted me to go to the right wing so that Matizama would go as will play as a striker. Oh, okay. But just around that time, we had first a first year student who came and was a wonderful footballer. The late uh, um, oh, ba Daniel Batidam, okay. who became uh, this, head this, of the Inter 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 Integrity family. International. Oh, okay. Yeah, the yeah. anti-corruption agent. He, he he was then playing for Upper West Hills. Oh, okay. When he got admission at Legon. And so when he came, it was good he came. Um, Shapiro was forced to abandon his plan of converting a man to a striker <laughs> and pushing me to the, <laughs> to, to the forward. To a position you, you didn't want. Yeah, so finally, we there. So it, after one training, Shapiro said, Ah, uh, Prof. Samuels wanted to see me. So as soon as I went there, he handed over my appointment letter to me. Oh, really? Yeah. I said, Wow. <laughs> So, <laughs> everybody wanted to see. I said, what? Well, I've got a job. I said, so what? Are you, are you leaving the school? A job at where? Yeah. <laughs> I said, so they asked me to report on the, I think somewhere around April. But I told them I couldn't do it because we're still preparing for the West Africa University Games, the GUSA Games and the West Africa University Games. So I couldn't make it. So the position was kept for me for another year. Really? Yes. Oh wow! Then the, the panel, the panel, uh, they they saw a jewel that they, they needed to keep. Yep. And and after that audition, what I did was that at that time the professional league was this professional at that time. Yes. They come out with the distinct that all clubs must cover video. Mm. They must have a video coverage of their matches. So as of all, we're going to play Kumapim Royals in Mampong. So Professor Mills went with me, and, and I did and, the commentary. And Prof Mills was with House of Oak. Yes, at that time he was the director of House of Oak. So he went with me, and I did the commentary, live commentary for House of Oak match against Kumapim. Oh, okay. It was a wonderful match. I remember then Nau, Anthony Tieku, Rizika Damu, Eben Dubate, Abladi Kuma, those young guys, and then Manuama and all those people. It was a good match. So after that, House of Oak missionaries, I did the coverage. House of Oak at Santo Kotoko, I did it. And, and all these were on GBC? Yes, GTV. I did it, and the, the clips were sent to GB, GTV. Yeah, okay. So GBC at that time saw that mm, we don't have to lose this boy. So even if he was not ready. We will be ready, we will wait. <laughs> <laughs> so immediately after school, I was also posted, national service, I was posted to Ascend District. And GBC wanted me to start work immediately. But the law also would not permit me because I had to finish my service Your before service. I, I start to work in as an, a, a full-time job. So GBC, I was asking that my national service was transferred. I was reposted to GBC. But I said no. At that time, let me be frank with you. Issues about corruption, issues about, you know, patronage, nepotism, and things were uh, like curses to me. You know, I don't want to compromise my principles. So I said, no, if the National Service has posted me to Fusu, I'll go to Fusu. Then journalism has always been in your life. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go to Fusu because God is the one who wanted maybe the people of that area needed me at that particular time. Yeah. And so I wouldn't want to be reposted to GBC. My mother was scared because she thought I would lose my... But I had options at that time. I had applied for a job at Senate. I had gotten it. I had applied for a job at VRA. I had gotten it. So I was spoiled for it. <laughs>